I really like about day three is there's not all that music that you have to dance to on the stage before you talk. So, so uh, as we're getting more people who are coming to sit, I was just thinking this morning, I uh, was on my way here and I took the exact same route except I was across the street. And so it took me completely in the wrong direction. And because I'm from New York, everything's on a grid. And suddenly I was kind of like lost. And I started to try and figure out where to go. But then as I was being, I was lost, I was like, wow, look at all these really interesting things along the way, I'm in Paris. And then I found like a guide where I said, where am I? And he said, oh, you just have to cross the street and it's like right there. And I thought it was this interesting metaphor for where we are right now, because so much of us are guided by our intuition. We know that the whole nature of work is completely changing. We know that it's gig-like and project-like, but we know that there's not like a grand plan. There, it's not there yet. And so we get a little bit lost, which is the theme of this conference, this gathering. And so what I think is so important is to follow your gut about where you're going. And so what I want to talk about now is um, what, what is this new workforce looking like? And we have like a funny high science thing where we click and talk. Did we get to the next? There we go. Perfect. So what's so significant is that right now there are 53 million Americans who are working independently. And that is now one in three. And we're gonna talk a little bit later, but what's so significant and so many of us in so many different countries are so frustrated by is that we know just how big this is. We know that this is hitting the fabric of, this, of our societies, but we also know that our governments that are measuring this are often coming up with these crazy numbers. So in the United States, for instance, it's called the contingent workforce, and it's at 8%. And we said, we just know that that's wrong. So we did, next slide. The next slide. No. So as you'll see, there shall be a next slide. There we go. And what is so significant is we said, not only do we know that that number is bigger than 53 million, but what we found was something really significant. 40% are independent contractors, which is what we, were, what we knew, but 27% were moonlighters. And that to me was the most significant thing is that now we can start to see that what's happening is that people are putting together their jobs and work and gigs and projects. Sometimes they're working full time and they're doing something on the side, maybe hosting or driving or a different kind of editing project. Sometimes they're putting together a bunch of different gigs. And that really to me is what's getting us to see that there's something much more complicated here. And so what's so significant is that people are starting to put together their lives in a very different way. S next slide. Um, and we're going to go to the next slide and then backwards. Do you mind just scooching to the next slide? Thank you. Now, what's so significant is when you start to think about who are the players in our world, right? We could kind of put this into an ecosystem and we can look and see that they're investors, they're entrepreneurs, they are consumers. Do those sound like the familiar groups? But there's also the earth. There's also two generations in the future and, and we always say two generations in the future because we really model it on the Iroquois Native Americans who always think seven generations in the future, but we say we're American, so maybe we can do two. That's a joke. And um, the last are workers. And what's so important is that we've had so many discussions here and we can feel like there's an intuition in it 
some parts of a shared conversation, but we also can feel that there's tension in ways that we're starting to see this kind of differently, and that's all okay because it's leading us to clarity. But if you just close your eyes for a second and just think, take a deep breath. Who are the investors? The investors, unless it's their own money, have somebody else's money. And that other person's money is telling them, we need the greatest rate of return. And they're no different than you. When you go make a stock choice for your retirement, you want the best rate of return, and so do they. Now let's go to a consumer. I'm a consumer. I want the best price possible. Maybe I have social concerns. But I very much come to this with a frame. And so do we as entrepreneurs. We want our project to do well, right? We, we have to have a kind of focus, which means we have to say no to certain things. Maybe we worry about competitors. Maybe we look for partners. And then so many of the speakers are talking about the earth and what are we doing? What are we, how are we thinking about this? And then very much in that vein, we're all here for just a set period of time and hopefully, you know, we have children and they have children and the people around us have children and that we need to think about what is the legacy and what we're being behind. So why am I saying this about work? Because what's so significant is that we could, we could make this like um, a big board here and we could ask everybody to sit in the, in the area that they identify with the most. And then we could say, which one are we going to privilege? And right now, we're privileging the investors. And I, I'm not saying that, you know, we could have a very interesting argument, but the point is that we are setting up our platforms and we're setting up our share economy, and we have to be doing it by the people who have the ability to make it scale. And so it's sort of setting up the whole way that we're thinking about this, which is, I have a need, I have an idea, I'm going to figure out the most marketable piece of that. And then I'm going to look for investors who are going to help me get this to scale. And you've heard this throughout the days, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just the truth that the investors are the ones with money, and we are at the very early stage of building. But if, let's say, we decided to go to the Earth, and we said, we are here for the Earth, and everybody went into the Earth quadrant, and we said, the only way we're going to evaluate this is by what's happening with um, climate change. And so every business is going to be evaluated by how did it affect climate change. A and you could do that. There would be consequences if we did that, because we would start to see that there would be ways that we wouldn't be building our businesses or we'd be foregoing so many things. But in fact, you could pick any frame around that circle and start to say, I'm going to actually reframe this whole conversation. And so what I want to start to do is now take that frame and start to talk about workers. One of the most important things is if we wanted to imagine a world, and again, this is a thought experiment. We are in magical thinking. We should all occasionally get out of our own frames because it really can help us. So now let's say I'm going to tell you that all workers are going to be paid a million dollars for all their work, whether they host or drive, uh, whether they run Airbnb. Everybody gets a million dollars what's going to happen? Well, not as many bu businesses may be built, but what would start to happen is we'd start to be thinking about how are we going to create those kinds of jobs, and I'd come up with like a million because it's kind of a ridiculous number, but what if I said $25 an hour in U.S. terms, and you thought about that in all the different currencies that, that we're all in? And we'd started to say, well, then maybe we'd start thinking about cooperatives. Maybe we'd start thinking about unions. Maybe we would start to say that a business that didn't have that kind of ability to generate that kind of money. So the purpose of this exercise is not for us to say, I'm for one, I'm against another, but to actually be really thinking in our analysis about what are we talking about, and that we don't just have to take the current dominant <coughs> The current dominant frame, <coughs> sorry, 
as the only one. So what I think is so significant is that if we start to think about this 53 million workers, and then we're just going to stay in this worker frame, what's happening with them? Interestingly, 85 to 88 percent of them say they want to work in this way. Oh, thank you. They want to work in this way, and they don't want to go back. At the same time, they're saying, I'm so incredibly anxious. Freelancers Union is um, based in the U.S. We have 300,000 members. We provide a full range of supports from health insurance to a great retirement plan. And we also have two primary care centers that give primary care for free with integrated medicine like yoga uh, and um, Tai Chi and meditation. And wh why do I tell you that? Because We've also run an insurance company with gross revenues of $100 million. And if there's one thing we know, it's freelancers' health. And if mine workers have the biggest problem of black lung disease, freelancers have the biggest problem with anxiety. And they have anxiety because their income is just so episodic. That is, it's gig-like. So it's feast or famine. And so isn't it interesting that the number one issue is anxiety yet 85 to 88 percent say they're happy. Why are they happy? Because what's happened is we have to look at this context, and I think if we all looked from every country that we came from, we know that we had in the U.S., we call it the New Deal, but everybody had massive social protections after World War II, where we said, here's the trade-off. You're going to get your benefits, you're going to have security, your kids are going to go to college, you're going to get a house. And people said, okay, passion, not so much. But what is now happening is people are saying, okay, no house, no retirement, no benefits, now I really want to start living a life that's freer because those trade-offs just aren't there. And that, I think, is the secret behind the 85 to 88 percent of happiness because people are starting to live a freelance life. We call it Freelance 360, where they're saying, I care about the people I love. I want to spend time with them. I want to follow and do the things that give me excitement and passion and fulfillment. And in this new life, I can piece together my work life. I can know, for instance, that I'll have two part-time jobs. I won't own a home or a car, but I can do the things that I want to do. And I think that that's really what's so significant, is that this is having just this huge, huge change. And so where we are now, I think, is the workers of the world are on strike. You know, they're starting to say, I'm not going to participate in the old rules. And while I might not be able to topple the very things that are giving me this anxiety, I'm going to start making very personal choices that are going to really give me power. And so I think then when we think about the future, it really falls into these two ways. One is kind of the close and near future, and I think of that as helping to provide benefits, co-working spaces, the shared economy, helping to kind of provide fill-in-the-gap uh, crap, the jobs that people can do in between. There's Upwork and Elance Odesk, and in every country we're seeing increasing temp firms. And what they're doing is they're kind of enabling people to put these things together so that they don't have to figure it out on their own. But that's just the first stage. And the second stage is really, to me, far more transformational. And that's where we have to start to say, we're envisioning a profoundly different economy. I think one that's based on markets, for sure, where revenues exceed expenses, because they don't see the government as the main subsidizer of all of this. But I also don't believe this binary view that everything is going to come from companies and investors, but that it actually has to also come from ourselves and have the capital stay in our communities, like cooperatives and other kinds of organizations that will be updated through new kinds of platforms. 
but really this new market type of system, this new capitalism, if you want to call it that, whatever collaborative economy, we have a million words, but we think of it as new mutualism. And it's this idea that we're connected to one another based on solidarity. Solidarity has two component points. The first one is spiritual, seeing yourself as part of something larger than yourself. And the second is internet, economic interconnection, that we are all in this together economically, and that we start to have a view that our actions affect two generations in the future, that we have to start to care about the earth as workers, as citizens, and that we come together. And so in closing, you know, I think that what's so important is that we start to say every, every part of that circle has a role to play, but no one part can tell us what the frame is going to be. It's really for us to start to redefine this and to start to say we need new capital structures, new ways of viewing this, because the ultimate goal is a world that's going to be best for us, best for our children, their children, their children, their children, etc. Thank you so much. <laughs>